Quickly, would uh, somebody just write in the comment section, uh, when J.D. Vance was standing for election, who was his Democratic opposition? Who from the Dems was standing, uh, well, to defeat him? Because I do not understand how those who have voted for uh, Vance now think him reading from Dr. Zeus is what they need in terms of representation. How does that work? Thank you, Madam President. I, I come um, to debate and to make an argument about whether we should continue funding Ukraine indefinitely because this country and this United States Senate has not actually had much of an argument about whether we should continue to fund Ukraine indefinitely. Um, it has become extremely commonplace among advocates for further Ukraine funding to frame this as the courageous against the partisan, those who in America's and Ukraine apparently's moment of need are expressing the great spirit of patriotism that animated us in World War II and other moments of great world conflict. And that those who don't want to send another $61 billion to Ukraine, well, uh, we're just the knuckle draggers. We're the people who are listening to the base. We're the people who are listening to the media, ignoring that so many of us have been criticizing America's Ukraine policy from the get-go when both the media and the base was much more supportive than they are today. One of the most preposterous arguments that I hear in defense of our policy in Ukraine is that it is bipartisan, that the experts know better. Perhaps Senator J.D. Vance doesn't know what the Joint Chiefs of Staff do. Perhaps the Republican base doesn't know what the experts in national security do. Maybe they, with their knowledge and their training and their intelligence briefings access, know something that the American people don't. So while the American people have grown more and more skeptical of this conflict, perhaps it makes sense that we should actually listen to the experts. And where have we heard that argument? So many times in the last many decades have we been asked to listen to the experts. And yet, we never actually ask what the track record of those experts is in matters of foreign policy. The experts, the bipartisan consensus, of course, got us into Vietnam a war that lasted nearly 15 years that saw the destruction of nearly 60,000 American lives and for what? It was the bipartisan foreign policy consensus, the experts that got us into a 20-year war in Afghanistan where American taxpayers for two decades funded things like how to turn Afghanistan into a flowering democracy or how to ensure that the Afghans had proper American thoughts about gender in the 21st century. Well, maybe that was a waste of money, and maybe the experts were wrong. Those same experts, of course, counseled us that we must invade Iraq because Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. And yet, Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction. And the war led not only to the destruction of 5,000 American lives and many, many hundreds of thousands of innocent people beyond that, but also led to the regional empowerment of Iran, which now we are told by those same experts is the biggest problem that we face in the Middle East. Now those experts have a new crusade. Now those experts have a new thing that American taxpayers must fund and must fund indefinitely, and it is called the conflict in Ukraine. Now we, at least most of us, I think, in this body, nearly all of us, I would hope, do not think that Ukraine deserved to be invaded. We certainly don't think that what has befallen the innocent civilians of Ukraine was deserved. We condemn it as we should. But we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing there, not how we feel about it? What is our objective there, not how sad we feel about what's befallen the innocent civilians? We have to engage in what the bipartisan experts have failed to engage in for 50 years, a conversation about strategy asking very specific, very discreet questions about what it is that we're doing there. What are we trying to accomplish? How long will it take to accomplish these things? And for how many millions or billions or trillions of dollars are we in for before we can accomplish these things? Now, I've heard any number of explanations from my colleagues who support our policy in Ukraine about what it is that we're trying to do. At the beginning of the war especially, you hear this argument far less, but at the beginning of the war especially, you would hear an argument that we had to throw Vladimir Putin back to the 1991 borders. 
Well, we don't hear that argument so much anymore. Why? Because it was preposterous then, and it's preposterous now. Ukraine is a country that now has about 28 million people. That's after many hundreds of thousands have died in the war, and many, many millions have left the country, probably permanently beyond that. Russia, by comparison, has 160 million people and has the industrial capacity to make many, many more times artillery shells and other critical weapons per day. So against that Leviathan in Eastern Europe, we are told somehow that the Ukrainians can win. Well, again, what is victory? We know now that throwing Russia back to the 1991 borders is preposterous. No one, not even the inner circle of Zelensky's own cabinet, makes that argument. They did a few months ago, but they don't make that argument anymore. So what is victory? And when you talk to people, both in public and in private, the actual thing that you can piece together that we're trying to do is to send enough weapons and send enough money to the Ukrainians until something good happens, until maybe the Russians get sick of the conflict and they come to the negotiating table. That, that's one opportunity uh, to end this war that we're told, is that if we just keep on going and we show our resolve, then Vladimir Putin will come to the negotiating table. And yet, if you listen to former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, or you listen even to some of the ministers in Zelensky's government, or certainly if you listen to a number of other Western European allies, they will say that Russia was willing to come to the negotiating table at the beginning of 2022, after the war had stalemated from the Russian perspective and after the Ukrainians had shown some real bravery and some real resolve. Now, it's not just Vladimir Putin who says this, it's virtually everyone who has ever talked about this moment and the conflict, and they will say that British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, backed by any number of leaders within the American security apparatus, basically said, tell Vladimir Putin to shove it. The Ukrainians are winning, the Russians are losing, so we'll just keep this war going for as long as it takes. So we had the opportunity to negotiate back in 2022, and if we had taken it, here's what would have happened. Many fewer hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians would have died. Uh, many fewer innocent civilians would have lost their lives, their homes, their livelihoods. And a war in Eastern Europe that has put stresses on everything from food supply to energy prices would have concluded. So, we're trying to get Vladimir Putin to the negotiating table. We don't have a pathway for how to do it, by the way. We just think that's a good thing, and we're going to try to do it if we continue to throw money. But yet, that same negotiating table was on the offer about 18 months ago, and we told them to go shove it. Okay, so uh, negotiating table, that seems to not be a realistic end goal if we just continue to funnel money and resources. So, so what is the end goal here? It is astonishing that not a single person from Joe Biden on down can actually articulate what another $61 billion can do. They'll tell you what it won't do. They'll tell you what the absence of $61 billion will do, but how weird is it that they want to send $61 billion to, America, uh, to America's ally Ukraine, and they can't actually tell you what it's supposed to accomplish, what this will accomplish that the previous $120 billion didn't. So first, we have a complete absence of strategy, a complete failure for the President of the United States to articulate what we're going to do. I try to imagine what it would have been in a, as an American citizen if on December the 8th, 1941, Franklin Roosevelt stood before the country and said, the Japanese have attacked us, it is a day that will live in infamy, and so we're gonna send money for as long as it possibly takes with no articulation of what we're gonna do, of what the battle plan is, of where we're fighting, of what we're gonna have our manufacturing base try to accomplish. We're just gonna send money and hope that eventually these guys come to the negotiating table. That is the equivalent of what we're doing at this moment in time with this particular conflict. Now, I mentioned just now our manufacturing base. So let's, let's talk about the costs of this conflict. We know there's no strategy. We know there's no plan to do anything other than just to funnel more and more money and more and more resources. What are the costs of continuing our posture in Ukraine? Well, let's go through them. And let me just make an observation about costs, about actually thinking about costs and considering the consequences of our actions. You know, it, it used to be common in American statesmanship that we hear this phrase, speak softly 
and carry a big stick. The idea was be smart in your strategic decisions. Be willing to hit back and hit back hard if you have to, but don't bluster. Don't brag. Don't pretend that you can do things that you can't. And a, and a fundamental part of American statesmanship, I think, is asking ourselves, what is it that we are costing ourselves by continuing to fund this war? Well, you've heard some of my colleagues talk about this already. We've got $61 billion on top of $34 trillion in debt. Can we actually afford to send another $61 billion to Ukraine? Can we afford to send the $100 billion that will be requested at some point next year? Can we afford the hundreds of billions of dollars of reconstruction costs that we've effectively committed ourselves to by funding the war in Ukraine indefinitely? You already hear these people like vultures with a carcass talking about how much money they're gonna make on the reconstruction of Ukraine. And I ask myself, why are we destroying the country in the first place, given that we know the war is at a stalemate and American diplomacy could plausibly bring it to a close? Now here's another thing that this is costing us, something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough in this chamber, but I'm reminded of the only time that I have ever been in the White House with a sitting president of the United States. It was about a week before the inauguration of Donald Trump and Mike Pence, and so I was there with President Barack Obama. I think it's important never to reveal confidences of private conversations, but he said something then, said something that was extremely interesting and I didn't he expect to hear from a Democratic president. What he said is that the refugee crisis in Europe in 2015 would take down a number of liberal governments. Now, me as a conservative, I might not care about liberal, liberal governments going down, but I thought it was interesting that a theoretically pro-immigration guy, a guy much more committed to the cause of open borders than almost any Republican I know, would say that when you have wide open borders and when you have uncontrolled migration, it destabilizes governments. Well, of course the former president is exactly right. Refugee crises do destabilize governments. Why are we not talking about the fact that in multiple countries in Southern Europe right now, they are being overwhelmed with people, not bad people, by the way. Most of them are just looking for food to feed their family or a job with a decent wage. But we are witnessing the beginning of what I will believe, believe will become the biggest refugee crisis in the history of the world. Why? Because in Africa, which has 1.5 billion people, most of whom have a standard of living much lower than what we have in the United States of America, you have grain prices through the roof, wheat prices, through the roof, barley prices, through the roof. And as anybody who is advocating an endless war in Ukraine asked what happens when 1.5 billion starving people start to move north to look for some food. You don't have to make any moral judgments about the plight that they will go on. You should make a moral judgment about the people in this building who refuse to think about the unintended consequences of their actions. Are we really willing to have over a billion people starving trying to pour into the borders of Europe and the United States of America? Are we really willing to set up a refugee crisis the likes of which the world has never been seen? And if we do that, what effect will it have on our allies in Europe? What effect will it have in our own country? What effect will it have for, number, uh, for millions of American citizens who are already dealing with the consequences of an overwhelmed southern border. And I want to talk about that overwhelmed southern border in a second, but I want to keep talking about the unintended consequences of the war in Ukraine. Another unintended consequence is, what do energy prices look like all over the world? We have no idea who blew up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. We can have some guesses. But it isn't kind of weird, and isn't it unusual for our European allies to have had their most important fuel artery destroyed, and they seem totally uninterested in asking questions about it. We already know that governments like those in Poland, like those in Slovenia, like those in a number of other allied countries across Europe are under an extraordinary amount of stress because fuel prices are so high. The country of Hungary, which has 10 million people, took in nearly a million Ukrainian refugees an important American ally by any standard, and yet they are facing skyrocketing energy prices because of the war between Russia and Ukraine. What effect does it have on the many millions of people who are living over there? What effect does, does it have 
on America's national security when we take down a number of allied governments because the people there can't afford food and can't afford energy. That is another unintended consequence. And while we're, while we're talking about the unintended consequence of energy prices in Europe, let's ask a very important question about why we're here. Now, my Democratic friends on the other side of the aisle act like Ukraine is the most significant issue confronting our country. You see the Ukrainian flag lapel pins. You see the way that people talk about it on social media. There is a species of American liberal who thinks that the Ukraine war is the most important thing confronting our country. But it's not so important that they will pursue common sense American energy policies. The reason, the reason why Russia is so powerful on the world stage today is one reason, because of stupid American and European energy policies. Preposterous energy policies that drive up the cost of natural gas. So while we, with the one hand, send $61 billion to Ukraine, we pursue a set of energy policies that drive up the cost of natural gas and enrich the Russian oligarchs who are paying for the war. We are literally paying for both sides of the war, the Russian side with dumb energy policy and $61 billion to Ukraine direct with American taxpayer subsidy. That is another unintended consequence. And my Republican friends, who I assume all of them agree with me on the idiocy of our modern energy policies in 2023 and 2024, why are they supporting a conflict that in fact is a cover for those energy policies? If, if, they, if they really cared about Ukraine as much as they say they did, perhaps they should force the President of the United States to stop enriching Russian oligarchs with terrible energy policy. But we're not doing that. We're going to continue to fund both sides of this war, and I guess that's just the way that it's going to be. Let's talk about another unintended consequence of our Ukraine policy. We are, at this very moment, incredibly stressed in how many weapons we can manufacture. I tell this statistic to people, and they're sometimes surprised by it. The first time that I heard it, I was surprised by it. America, if you measure it by GDP, is, of course, the largest economy in the world, and we are 10 times the size of the Russian economy. And yet, the most important weapon in Eastern Europe today are 155 millimeter artillery shells. It's one of the reasons why 400,000 Ukrainians, that's the best estimate, have died during this conflict, is because the Russians have an incredible advantage in artillery. So you ask yourself, we're 10 times the size of the Russian economy, how many artillery shells do we make in a month and how many artillery shells do the Russians make in a month? Well, we make in a month about 30,000 artillery shells. That's up from about 20,000 artillery shells a month at the beginning of the conflict. Guess how many the Russians make? They make about 25,000 artillery shells a day. So in a month, the United States, the biggest economy in the world, makes weapons at a rate per month that the Russians are able to meet in a single day. Well, one thing that suggests to me is that GDP numbers are awfully fake. If you can't produce weapons to defend your own people, then you can't pretend that your economy is as strong as you might like to think. Unfortunately for Wall Street, we cannot fight wars with dollars and derivatives. We need weapons. We need bullets. We need artillery shells. We need missiles. And America doesn't make nearly enough of those. Not for our own security and certainly not enough to support both the Ukraine conflict and, God forbid, a conflict that might occur, occur in East Asia. So let's specify that a little bit more. We're right now depleting critical munitions, missiles, artillery shells, and bullets faster than we can replenish them, and then we send them to Ukraine. Well, I'm sorry, why does that make an ounce of sense for our own national security? Shouldn't we rebuild our own manufacturing capacity before we spend all of it on Ukraine? Shouldn't we make more of our own weapons and gain some self-sufficiency in weapons manufacturing before we send all of those resources to Ukraine? The answer of the United States Senate is apparently not. So on issue after issue after issue. Madam President. Senator from North Carolina. I'm inquiring to see if the gentleman from Ohio would yield to a question about this subject matter. Will the gentleman yield? I'm happy to yield, Madam President. Um, thank you, Senator Vance. Senator Vance, uh, 
This appropriations bill that's before us, uh, I just want to make sure that I've got my facts right. I believe that there are seven or $35 billion to restore U.S. military readiness and modernization. I also believe that, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, that for every dollar we're sending you to Ukraine, we're appropriating about $2.50 to make sure that we backfill and cover. There are a lot of bad and unintended consequences to this conflict. One of the good ones is learning before we have to defend ourselves that we are grievously out of step with manufacturing capacity. And it is my understanding that $35 billion, about half of the money that's being appropriated to Ukraine, is actually being appropriated back to the industrial base and uh, for Patriot missile manufacturing, a number of other vulnerabilities that we found, we're trying to address it. Uh, is, that, is that, do I have a correct understanding of that? Um, to my colleague from North Carolina, before I answer that question, Madam President, can I inquire to how much time I have? And uh, Madam President, I would also like to state that I have, or I have time that I will, in response to my question, I will yield my time uh, for the purposes of you allowing uh, to have time beyond the answer to the question. The Senator from Ohio has 40 minutes remaining. So, Ma Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the only time that, that the only time used by the Senator from North Carolina be debited to his post-closure time and that to answer his question, we not have time deducted from my account? Is there objection? Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so, to my, to my colleague and friend uh, from North Carolina, I want that this legislation contains a lot of resources. I think $35 billion is the number. But we have to ask ourselves not just how much money is going to rebuild our industrial base, but combined with presidential drawdown authority, how much of that will then be just redirected to Ukraine. My understanding is that given the current authorizations and given the current appropriations, while a lot of this money will go, and I'm glad that it will go, to places like Ohio and Alabama to manufacture weapons, those weapons will then be mostly sent to Eastern Europe because we're currently spending resources and munitions in Eastern Europe at a rate that is far faster than our own industrial base's ability to, um, to replenish them. So what will happen in effect is that we will make the weapons and literally faster than we can make them, they will then go out to the door to Eastern Europe unless, of course, in the next few months or the next couple of years, the conflict ends. So the gentleman's question is well taken, but it actually doesn't address the core concern that we're depleting munitions much faster than we can replenish them. And I, I want to just, on, on one final point here, if, if I may, and I'll be quick because I know that I'm on uh, borrowed time here. Um, the question of whether we should rebuild our industrial base is some, something my friend and I agree on, and I think most of my colleagues here in the United States agree on. The more difficult question is what do we do in the interim? It will take years to get our industrial base to the point, maybe three years, maybe five years, to get our industrial base to the point where it could support a war in Eastern Europe and a war in East Asia simultaneously. We don't debate the need to rebuild our industrial base. The question is, what do we do in the interim? And I think in the interim, continuing to support the Ukraine war indefinitely is a terrible, terrible mistake. Madam President, I, I, I suppose I could go back on my own clock. Uh, I ask. I don't know what I'm supposed to say here, but. The, the Senator will resume. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate your charity, and I appreciate you having to sit up there and listen to me. Um, members of our gallery chose this, but uh, some of us did not, so I appreciate you and, and my staff. But um, let, me, let me keep on, on going here on how we got here. I've articulated to the best of my ability why I think we don't have a strategy here and why I think it's important for us to actually articulate a strategy what it means for us to not have that strategy, and importantly, the unintended consequences of continued conflict in Eastern Europe, backstopped by the American taxpayer. But I want to talk about the politics of this. Not long ago, or I should say, excuse me, uh, not long after Russia invaded Ukraine, I made an observation that frustrated a lot of my friends who advocate for continual conflict in Ukraine. I said 
how can we support a war in Ukraine? We defend Ukraine's borders when we're not even defending our own American border under the presidency of Joe Biden. And the response that came back went something like this, and I'll paraphrase it as much as I can. America can walk and chew gum at the same time. A great power should, in theory, be able to support uh, an ally in Eastern Europe while at the same time securing its own southern border. And I think the events of the last week have revealed just how preposterous that argument is. We clearly are not able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And in fact, if we were able to walk and chew gum at the same time, we would secure our border first and we would have done it weeks or months ago, but certainly we would have done it this past week. Now here's the basic political dynamic that unfolded, and I know my colleague from Kentucky has discussed this, so have others. The basic political dynamic that unfolded is the Republicans in the Senate said, we want border security. That is the issue around which Republicans are unified. We want border security. And of course, the Democrats are in charge. Uh, the, the Democratic leader is the majority leader of the Senate. We have a Democratic president. So what do the Democrats want? What unites the Democrats that doesn't unite us? And the answer came back, Ukraine. The Democrats want to send $61 billion to Ukraine. The Republicans want to secure the border. And there was the root of a potential compromise. In divided government, sometimes you have to make compromises. Nobody is happy, but there was a potential compromise that could be made. And here's what the argument, here's how the argument went. If we're gonna send $61 billion to Ukraine, we should do it first in tiers. We shouldn't send it all at once. We should stagger it out a little bit. And the reason we should do that is to ensure that Joe Biden actually keeps his promise and enforces the American southern border. In other words, we tell the president that you don't get another dime of American taxpayer money for Ukraine unless you bring illegal border crossings at the level they were during the presidency of Donald Trump. That, to me, was the negotiation as it was set up by the Republican conference. That was the understanding that me and so many of my colleagues in the Republican conference had. And of course, that negotiation could go many places. It could go a place that might make Democrats uncomfortable. It could go a place that might make some of my Republican friends uncomfortable. In theory, to get a deal, it would sort of get everybody a little uncomfortable, but you'd be able to get 60 senators to pass it and send it on to the House. Well, that's not what happened. What was produced instead was a secret negotiation where Republican senators, by and large, had very, very little input in the process and where we had no idea what was actually in the final package. We heard it through rumor and through conversations with friends, but immigration law is complicated. What a colleague, even a well-meaning colleague, tells you exists in a, in a piece of immigration law doesn't matter nearly as much as the text of the actual immigration law. So that text finally dropped on Sunday of last week. I believe February 4th, that legislation dropped. A 370-page piece of legislation that would commit many, many billions of dollars to Ukraine, a few billion dollars to East Asia, a few billion dollars to Israel, and a few billion dollars combined with this is the worst. Let's just walk through a few of those. Number one, parole. The last Democratic president, Barack Obama, paroled approximately 5,000 illegal aliens per year. That's 5,000 per year. Joe Biden, in three years, has paroled between 600,000 and close to a million illegal aliens per year. That is not a typo or, or an overstatement. So Joe Biden radically increased parole authority, and that doesn't just have the direct effect of making nearly a million illegal aliens legal, it also has a secondary effect. Because if you are in Central America or you're anywhere in the world and you would like to come to America and not go through the proper channels, now all of a sudden the clarion call has gone out. Joe Biden has thrown open the southern border and if you come across illegally, he will parole you close to a million times per year when the last Democrat did it 5,000 times per year. That is the first effect of Joe Biden's parole, and our great border compromise did nothing to limit Joe Biden's parole authority. Number two, another problem with our border law is that it has been manipulated so that we turn so-called illegal aliens into so-called asylum seekers. Here's how it works. We, of course, want to be a country that's welcoming to those who are fearing persecution. So if you come into this country, as an economic migrant, and you come illegally, you come having not followed the laws of this country, 
you can claim asylum. And if your asylum claim is granted, you immediately receive amnesty and you are on the track to becoming a citizen of this country, even though you never followed the law to get into the country in the first place. The other effect of our jacked up, excuse me, the other effect of our problematic asylum laws is that even if the asylum claim is not granted, you can be released into the country for a period of years, sometimes even decades, before an immigration judge hears your claim. So let's say you're an economic migrant. You show up at the American southern border. You say that I am an asylum claimant fearing persecution, and a, a, an administrative official from Customs and Border Patrol says, well, we have to adjudicate your asylum claim. You can't do that right now, so what we'll do is ask an immigration judge to hear that claim in 12 years, you're free to hang out in America for the next 12 years. Well, that is an effective amnesty. And again, it sends a message all across the world that America is open for business and we can have a wide open southern border. That's what it does. This particular legislation actually made that problem worse. Now, on the one hand, it tried to increase the standard for granting asylum from a credible fear standard to a reasonable fear standard, but importantly, it changed the people who were enforcing that standard from immigration judges to CIS officers at the United States Customs and Immigration Services. These are people who are widely believed to have some of the most pro-asylum views within the United States government, so millions of people could come across the southern border, claim asylum, and have their claim granted unilaterally. That would put them on the pathway to citizenship. That would put them in a competitive posture with American citizens for jobs and for other important um, benefits. And yet, this legislation trying to fix the border actually made the asylum process worse. So here we are with a border compromise that actually makes the border security problems in this country worse. And let me just say what we would need to do if we really wanted to secure the border is very simple, we just have to make Joe Biden do it. He has the tools necessary. He has the legal authority necessary to secure the border. The real debate, whether you're using Ukraine money as leverage or something else, is how do we force Joe Biden to do his job? This legislation didn't do that. It didn't even come close to doing that. And so most Republicans rejected it. So now here we are, an hour after the first foray of border security negotiations, the first volley where Democrats give us border security and Republicans give $61 billion in Ukraine, and what happens? It, it, it doesn't succeed. For the reasons I just articulated, the gross majority of my Republican colleagues didn't like that proposal, and so it got dropped. And what you might expect happen in a good faith negotiation that was actually about the border, if we were actually trying to secure the border, you might have said, this is not the Democrats' best offer. Let's go back to the negotiating table. Let's continue to push for border security because that is the most pressing crisis that we face as a country. And what happened instead is after an hour, Senate Democrats and even some in Republican leadership decided that we should move on from border security. They had checked the box. Now let's move on to their real priority, which is sending another $61 billion to Ukraine. It stinks to high heaven, ladies and gentlemen. No one who watched this process unfold believes that Republican leadership negotiated in good faith for border security or that Democrats did the same. It was always kabuki theater. It was always an excuse to say, we tried on the border, now let's move on to the thing that really matters, which is the money for Ukraine. And that failure, the way that it blew up in the faces of our leadership and the appearance gave lie to the idea that this was ever really about border security. And by the way, it alienated millions of Republican and independent voters who want their government to focus on the most pressing problem for this country, and that is the border. When I go back home to Ohio and I talk to audiences about their views on Ukraine, most people agree with me, but some people disagree with me. But if you go to an audience in the state of Ohio, a state that is affected tragically by the fentanyl problem, where you will drive on highways and see billboards for sex trafficking victims to call the hotline because they're being sex trafficked in the state of Ohio by Mexican drug cartels who have been given free reign at the southern border. 
If you talk to people and ask them what are the most pressing problems the country faces, none of them will say Ukraine. Even those who would like to send more money to Ukraine, none of them will say Ukraine. So what are we doing? Why did we give up so easily? Why did Republicans stab their voters in the back? Why did we not fight for border security? Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what we promised we would do. Many of us did, by the way. Even some of my colleagues who disagree with me on the Ukraine question, they at least had the courage to stand and fight for border security. But unfortunately, too, far too many Republicans refused. And so we are, we are where we are. Now let me, just make, um, let me just make an argument about where we are on this particular border situation. We have millions of people coming into the country illegally every single year. We have hundreds of thousands dying just in the first three years of Joe Biden's term of fentanyl overdoses. We have a president who has invited the opening of the American southern border, and now we are living with the consequences. The American people know that this was the direct result of Joe Biden's policies, and they know that he could stop it. So let's debate real border security, border security that actually forces the president to do exactly that. There are a number of options on the table. You will sometimes hear some of my Democratic colleagues and even some in Republican leadership say, we can't have a bill because Donald Trump doesn't want us to have a bill that if we advance common sense border security, Donald Trump would destroy it. That is the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, just last week, Donald Trump proposed a border security bill that would force Joe Biden to secure the southern border. You may agree or disagree with the policy, but the idea that there is no policy that would get Republican buy-in, including at the top of the Republican ticket, is preposterous. It's something that does not exist in reality. Madam President, what's, how much time do I have left? The Senator has 25 minutes remaining. Great. So I've given my spiel here, and I want to get a little bit into the details of what we're trying to accomplish here and how we might try to accomplish it. Let's first start with a conversation about the American southern border. I want to read a piece from the Washington Post an argument that I, I want to read and then I want to respond to. Having failed to convince the American people that a blank check to U Ukraine, President Vol Volodymyr Zelensky is in their interest, the Ukraine First Caucus now claims the aid primarily benefits American workers. Mark A. Theason, who drafted an op-ed to this point, exemplified the pivot. This is disingenuous and dangerous, and this is partially in response to some of the arguments that I've heard earlier. We cannot rebuild our industrial base by building capacity and sending all of it to Ukraine. It doesn't make sense. Now, I support, we support increasing defense spending and building up our defense industrial base. As expansion of our military manufacturing capacity benefits American workers and bolsters our national security. Washington is more focused on sending our limited military stockpiles to a conflict in Ukraine with no clear path to victory. The Biden administration's new message fails to account for grave shortages in our stockpiles. Thanks to nearly two years of mission in Ukraine, the United States is perilously unready for any additional contingency. Anything with solid rocket motors is in short supply. Solid rocket motors are the rocket motors that power so many of the critical missile systems that we need. And whether it's javelins or stingers or Patriot missiles, we are critically in short supply of not just the missiles themselves, but of some of the components that are necessary for building those missiles, including the SM-6s that would be needed in the Pacific. The high demand for Stingers, Javelins, and Patriot interceptors in Ukraine means we are desperately short of the weapons that would be needed in Taiwan. Replenishing them is going to take years. And I'm going to just pause here to make an observation. One of the arguments my friends make in defense of $61 billion to Ukraine is that we need to send a message to Vladimir Putin that if we give up and walk away from the Ukrainian battlefield, even though the leader of Ukraine's own military until recently said they had no chance of victory on that battlefield, if we give up, then it will send a message to Xi Jinping, the leader of China, that we are not a steadfast ally. What they're arguing, in effect, 
is that it will weaken American deterrence, that process by which we prevent our enemies and our adversaries from doing things that we don't want them to. Well, in classical foreign policy circles, deterrence is the combination of, on the one hand, um, resolve, and on the other hand, capacity. And they're making an argument about resolve. They're saying that if we show weakness to Xi, we will be showing a weakening of American resolve. We'll show that America can't stand in there and fight the fight. And look, I'm obviously a critic of further aid to Ukraine, but it is true that American resolve is important, and we should do everything that we can to show American resolve. But you know what's more important than American resolve? You know what's more important than thumping our chest like eighth graders on a playground and saying, we're tough, we're strong, we can do it? What's much stronger than that is to actually have the capacity to defend ourselves and our allies, and that is what is so weak. Xi Jinping does not care how tough America acts. He cares how strong America is. And if we use our ammunition, our missiles, our artillery on a war in Eastern Europe, if we don't even have the bullets to defend ourselves and our allies, it doesn't matter how tough we act, she will do whatever he wants all over the world, and that's what this is ultimately about. We are trying to rebuild our country. What do we do in the interim? What do we actually do when our country is in a weak enough place because of decisions made over 30 or 40 years? I find it interesting that so many of the people, from the news commentators to my Senate colleagues, Republican and Democrat, who actively advocated shipping our industrial base to East Asia and Mexico are now the people who are most fervently advocating for endless war in Ukraine. Here's the game they played. Send all of our weapons manufacturing, send all of our defense industrial base, send it everywhere but the United States of America. And now that America is in a tough spot, we should fight every conflict everywhere. Even though we don't make the weapons that we need to support those conflicts, and why don't we make those weapons? It's because these guys encouraged us to ship our industrial base overseas. Those of you who are students of history will, hear, will have heard the term arsenal of democracy. America was the arsenal of democracy. We won World War II, not because of chest thumping, not because we showed the strongest resolve, but because we had the strongest people and the strongest economy in the world. So at a time, when America faces a number of problems, including the southern border here at home, at a time when we are weaker in manufacturing capacity than we've been at any time in the last half century, this is the point when these people want to send unlimited weapons to Ukraine. This is the point where they want to send weapons not just to Ukraine, but to many theaters all across the world. Let's have an honest conversation about the decisions that have been made and how they've made this country weaker. Let's not pretend that weakness doesn't exist and send an unlimited number of weapons to Ukraine in the interim. Now, I wanna move on to another argument, but before I do, I am mindful of something that's very close to my heart personally. I have, a, I have three beautiful children. I have a six-year-old baby boy named Ewan, not so much of a baby anymore. I have a four, or excuse me, I have a two-year-old baby named Mirabelle, who is still very much a baby, and I love her very much. And I have a little guy named Vivek Gabriel Vance, who was three, year olds, three years old yesterday, but turned four today. And I'm sorry, Vivek, that I can't be with you for your birthday dinner, but I want you to know that Daddy loves you very much. And I'm gonna read this into the record because maybe you can watch it at home. Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places you'll go. Congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places, you're off and away. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who will decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some, you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there, 
in the wide open air. Out there things can happen, and frequently do, to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along, you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to great heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump, and the chances are then that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You'll come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lightened, but mostly they are dark. A place you could sprain both your elbow and your chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right and three quarters, or maybe not quite. Or go around back and sneak in from behind. Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find. For a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start into race. Down long wiggled rocks at a breaknecking pace. And grind on for miles across weirdish wild space headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place, for people just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow, or waiting for a vote. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for the wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape. All that waiting and staying, you'll find the bright places where the boom bands are playing. With banner flip-flapping, once more you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of a guy. Oh, the places you'll go, there is fun to be done, there are points to be scored, there are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame, you'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV, except when they don't because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too, games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not, alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go, though the weather be foul, on you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hack and cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far, and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft and never mix up your right foot with your left. And you will succeed, yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So be your name Buxbaum or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai, Alley, Van Allen, O'Shea or Vivek. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. I love you. 
Returning to the matter at hand, Madam President, or, or Mr. President, excuse me, how much time remains? Thirteen minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to read this piece, which articulates my argument for peace very well, written in Responsible Statecraft, published on July 5th of 2023. We're now, think about it, nearly a year since this piece was published, and its arguments are, if anything, more pressing today than they were last summer. Quote, last year, referring to the possibility of escalation that the Russo-Ukrainian war entails, President Joe Biden announced that America and the world are closer to a destructive nuclear war than ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Perhaps no other statement from the highest level of government could so directly affirm the failure of American grand strategy and foreign policy in the post-Cold War world. What seemed to be a Hollywood sci-fi scenario that the average American in the 21st century did not even think about is now a possibility that experts, policymakers, and world leaders like President Biden discuss regularly. As America and the world grapple with the tectonic shifts that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has unleashed, war budgets around the world keep increasing. In 2022, global spending on defense reached an all-time high of $2.24 trillion. The U.S. defense budget accounted for almost 40% of the total, surpassing the next 10 countries combined, including China, Russia, India, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany. Yes, America's ever-increasing military expenditures have hardly translated into success stories in the 21st century. The trillions of dollars pumped into questionable military adventurism abroad, such as the invasion of Iraq in 2003, have yielded equally questionable results, not only for U.S. interests and national security, but also for global security. America's over-reliance on the military to achieve policy objectives and the unilateral actions pursued without an international mandate have backfired in the form of a growing coalition of dissatisfied states that refuse to accept a world order that they see as unjust and hierarchical. In April of 1953, President Dwight D. Eisenhower delivered the famous Chance for Peace speech in which he compared the enthusiasm for a just and peaceful world after World War II to the unstable, hostile, and unpredictable environment of the Cold War. The eight years that have passed have seen that hope waver, grow dim, and almost die. And the shadow of fear again has darkly lengthened across the world, he said, before laying out his vision of a just and peaceful order and warning against the unbalanced political influence of military interests. Today, 70 years later, the world faces the same shadow of fear as the unpredictable war unleashed by a revisionist Russia shakes the international system. Biden's promised end of America's forever wars that was supposed to bring stability and predictability back to the realm of international affairs, while also allowing the United States to reorient its resources towards a much needed domestic revival did not materialize. While the war in Ukraine poses a significant threat to U.S. national security interests and necessitates an appropriate policy response, including security assistance to Ukraine for self-defense, look, this guy even believed in security assistance to Ukraine up to a certain point, U.S. military spending was growing even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This pattern should raise questions about whether the United States should have increased spending on the military in response to the crisis in Ukraine. The war has also turned into a talking point for those whose direct interests tied to military spending overshadow the actual interests of the American people. Many are now pushing for the concept of a long standoff with foreign rivals, without accounting for the real costs and implications that will be borne by ordinary citizens both in America and abroad. In foreign affairs, discourse and reality are sometimes interwoven in complicated and nuanced ways. Conflict can arise as much from actual strategic disagreements, security considerations, and national interests as from discourse and perceptions. In this context, embracing conflict and promoting discourse that emphasizes a long-term confrontation is a dangerous path for America to follow. The very cause of World War I has been attributed to the perceptions of threats and the interpretation of actions by states as hostile, leading some scholars to argue that European leaders sleepwalked into a conflict they neither desired nor expected to win easily. The question for Americans today, especially the new generation that will be inheriting a more unstable and dangerous world, 
is whether they will allow America to sleepwalk into a conflict that the United States neither needs nor can afford to win. Traditionally, American voters do not attach much importance to foreign and defense policy issues. Yet the citizens of a country that will be spending a record $842 billion on the military cannot afford to close their eyes on such critical policy issues that in fact profoundly affect their livelihoods. The question is not whether America should abandon its legitimate security needs and interests, nor neglect the foreign threats that necessitate spending on the military. We must understand how much of the current spending is actually justified. We also need to assess the efficiency of the military to protect the American people and interests abroad without overextending resources wastefully and prompting a dangerous arms race that will paralyze growth, development, and more importantly, the long-term prospect for peace and a new, more just world order. This is why young Americans should be especially concerned with the unchecked influence of special interests that seek to inflate threats, install the inevitability of long-term confrontation in the world, and justify ever-increasing spending on the military. The new generation will be the primary bearer of such burdens, costs and consequences that decisions taken in Washington today will have. Ultimately, it boils down to a simple question of the kind of vision young Americans have for their country and the world. The question is especially critical given America's own undeniable internal strife. Those seeking to downplay the legitimate critique of the over-reliance on military forget or deliberately neglect that foreign policy is ultimately dependent on domestic policy. Both experts and the general public now agree that the once hailed American democracy is threatened. The inflection point for America is serious. The country is facing a crisis of identity, social cohesion, a growing discontent with the economic model that has marginalized an ever-growing segment of the population, and what is more concerning, a waning belief and trust in the country's most foundational institutions. Those championing a new age of unnecessarily militaristic and confrontational foreign policy that relies on growing and unbalanced defense budgets should rethink the use of those resources. A stroll in the streets of Portland or in the infamous Skid Row in Los Angeles could be beneficial to reevaluate priorities and distributions of limited resources to deal with the most pressing issues America faces. Ultimately, the strength and attractiveness of the United States on the global stage and America's competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis its rivals depends on the domestic revival of a country that has been decaying silently for decades in virtually all key aspects. This is why a new generation of Americans must step in to seize the new chance for peace before it is too late. As the world order continues to fracture, only a wave of democratization of the most undemocratic sphere of policymaking in Washington can trigger the kind of reassessment and accountability the American people should expect from their elected leaders. Unless we take steps now to usher in an overdue reckoning in Washington, we may miss, as President Eisenhower said, a precious chance to turn back the tide of events. That was by Martin Makarian, and that again is from Responsible Statecraft, an important argument and an important piece. Let me address just a couple of points brought to mind by that piece and by that argument. You will hear, especially in the last couple of days after former President Donald Trump criticized NATO, you will hear a strong argument about what NATO means to the United States of America. And I think it's important for us and for our citizens to be honest, not just about the problems inherent with NATO and the lack of burden sharing, but also the problems that exist in NATO's own countries, countries that most of us love that most, most of us see as important allies, but have deep, deep pathologies and problems that must be addressed. Something that, that is often said is that in this particular conflict, Ukraine versus Russia, NATO is actually carrying its fair share of the burden. You will see charts that make an argument that NATO, which has the economy approximately the size of the United States of America, is spending actually more resources on Ukraine than the United States of America. Now that argument has a few critical flaws. Let's walk through them. First of all, NATO is providing a, a large amount of humanitarian assistance, and of course they're absorbing a large amount of refugees. They're doing it because Ukraine is in their backyard. But the critical weapons and munitions that are being provided are overwhelmingly the responsibility of the United States of America. 
NATO is not carrying its fair share of the burden when it comes to weapons, and that's the most important things the Ukrainians need to win. Second, even if we assumed, and it's wrong, but even if we assumed that NATO was carrying its fair share of the burden over the last 18 months, NATO has failed to carry its fair share of the burden for literally decades, ladies and gentlemen. Look just at how much money the United States has spent on defense since 1992 and compare that to our NATO allies. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been subsidizing European security to the tune of trillions of dollars. And it might feel nice when we go to Munich and the Europeans thank us, and it might be great to get a pat on the back from a European head of state, but the American people demand that NATO carry its fair share of the burden. Germany is the largest economy in Europe. They have promised for decades, and especially over the last years, that they would meet the NATO threshold of 2% of GDP spent on defense. They are still not there. Italy, a massive economy, still underspends on defense. In fact, most of the economies of Europe, outside of the UK and France and some economies in Eastern Europe, most of the economies of Europe massively underspend on defense, and that has invited aggression, not just from Vladimir Putin, but from other places as well. And at the same time that world leaders play armchair general with the Ukraine conflict, their own societies are decaying. Not a single country, not a single country, even the United States within the NATO alliance, has birth rates at replacement level. We don't have enough families and children to continue as a nation, and yet we're talking about problems 6,000 miles away. We are being invaded by up to 10 million illegal migrants over the course of Joe Biden's term in office, and we have apparently no president with willpower to stop that problem. We have a fentanyl crisis that has led to the deaths of over 100,000 people per year in the last few years of our youngest and brightest people. Mental health crises are skyrocketing. Youth suicides are skyrocketing. And every single place, not just the United States, but every single one of the countries in the NATO alliance see similar, or in some cases, even more troubling dynamics on most of those metrics, from migration to economic malaise. What are we doing, ladies and gentlemen? China and Russia, if we want them to fear us, we need to rebuild our own countries. We need to rebuild a strong Europe and a strong America. We need to rebuild a civilization that can support conflicts instead of just run away from them, because right now we don't have that. We do not have a country and we do not have a NATO alliance that is strong enough to do the things that need to be done. So our message to the Europeans need, need to be simple. Fix your own country, share your own burden, spend more on defense, fix your own problems, and that will deal with the problem in Russia far more than a $61 billion check to Ukraine will. In fact, we are subsidizing them. We are enabling their refusal to spend enough resources on defense. And I see that my time is up, Mr. President. Thank you.